Good afternoon to everybody. It's, thank you. It's usually it's customary to respond to a greeting, at least where I come from. And I'd like to say that um, I'm very happy to be here in Munich. It's my uh, second visit to this city. Some people came up to me yesterday and said they didn't think I looked very happy. But I can assure you, after dancing with Matilda last night, I'm extremely <laughs> happy. I uh, want to first of all say thank you to the organizers of this Congress. Um, organizing an event of this kind takes many people, many people's contribution and many months of very, very hard work. So I would like to thank, perhaps thank on behalf of everybody here, all the organizers. Uh, not only those who are visible, but those who are not so visible, those who cooked, those who drove cars, those who are looking after headsets and bookstore, those who are translating, everybody who made this Congress such an important event and uh, a valuable experience for everybody. And I could uh, say more about organizers and organizing, but I'm told I can't, there are many things I'm not allowed to say. So I will um, say something about what I've been asked to speak about. I've been asked to say something about the uh, fifth Manchester Pan-African Congress. Some of you may not know very much about it. I have some photos or pictures to show, which uh, people requested that I show. I know we're short of time. So we'll see how we do with that. And then uh, it's also important from the point of view of uh, as a historian, but for all of us to have some uh, concern with history. And we had some, dis some discussion on this um, yesterday. So I also want to talk about the 70 years since the Manchester Pan-African Congress uh, and some of the current challenges for the Pan-African movement internationally. So the, the first thing I should greet you also on behalf of the organizing committee for the 70th anniversary uh, commemoration of the Manchester Pan-African Congress. And that commemoration will be held next weekend in Manchester in Britain. And uh, I also greet you uh, from Britain. And in Britain, we like to think Britain is the home of Pan-Africanism. As you know, the first ever Pan-African Conference was held in London. The second Pan-African Congress was held in London. The third Pan-African Congress was held in London. The fifth Pan-African Congress was held in Manchester. So we like to think that Britain is the inventor of Pan-Africanism. That's a British joke, anyway. It mean, doesn't, tra doesn't tra translate very well in Munich. So why is the 5th Pan-African Congress important? Why should it be remembered? What can we learn from it today? Of course, at that time in 1945, there were very, it was a very different situation in the world. The war was just coming to an end. Uh, and in fact, at the time that the Manchester Congress was organized, the organizers had the view that it was just a, um, a precursor to a bigger and more important congress which would be held in Africa. Uh, they said that too many congresses have been held outside of the continent. Uh, but they took the opportunity to organize in Europe. Initially, they, the congress was going to be held in Paris, but because they thought the weather would be better in Manchester, and for other reasons, the Congress was held in Britain rather than in France. The Congress, if I, we can show, this is a, a well-known picture of that Congress. I'll say more about it in a moment. Um, I, perhaps I should just point out that the 
war, Second World War was just coming to an end. And so there was uh, a great expectation, not only amongst Africans, but also internationally, that the world after the Second World War would be a very different place. A world without war, a world without colonialism, a world without racism, and so on. And the Congress was organized in order to take advantage of that moment and to, we can say, sum up the experience of the Pan-African movement of that time and to set the tasks for the coming period. And it's useful perhaps to think about that, that very often when we meet at these events, um, we forget that summation. Um, and we also often forget to set tasks for the coming period. So we meet, we network, we go away, and then we reassemble in two years or three years. So this practice that uh, was developed in 1945, I think, is quite uh, important and significant. I'm just going to mention very briefly, because people have asked me to talk about some of the organizers of that Congress. So if we can have the next slide, please. This is one of the main organizers of that Congress, George Padmore originally from Trinidad, uh, a former communist who then became the major key organizer of this Congress. Next slide, please. The other, we can say, major organizer was Kwame Nkrumah. In fact, uh, this was probably the first major event that Nkrumah was involved in organizing um, of a pan-African character, and as you know, Later, uh, Nkrumah invited Padmore to Ghana as his special advisor on African affairs. So that relationship developed from this Congress. Next, please. The third key figure was uh, someone who people forget about today, Isaac Wallace Johnson from Sierra Leone, a very important labor organizer throughout West Africa, also trained in Moscow who had been imprisoned by the British colonial authorities throughout the war uh, and was released just in time to attend the Congress in Manchester. Next slide, please. And this, uh, another very well-known figure and a key activist in Britain, this is Amy Ashwood Garvey, the first wife of Marcus Garvey, an activist from the 1920s up until the 1960s, active in Britain, the Caribbean, the US, and in Africa. Uh, one more. Yes, well, this is another well-known person who was also based in Britain, Jomo Kenyatta, who was also one of the key organizers of uh, the event. And then the next. And the last was uh, W.B. Du Bois. Now, Du Bois didn't organize the Manchester Congress at all. As you know, he was the organizer of the previous four congresses in 1919, 1921, 23, and 27. But he played no role in organizing in Manchester. And in fact, the organizers in Britain made sure that he didn't play any role in the Congress. They said that they wanted a very different type of Congress from the, one, the ones that had been organized uh, before. And... Uh, one of the key things about the Manchester Congress was that it was the first Congress which was concerned with the, what they called the masses of the people. They said that we are mainly concerned with the majority of people in Africa and throughout the diaspora. That is to say those who were workers and those who were farmers, those who produced, who were the wealth producers. They said to Du Bois that... Uh, the days when the people are waiting for doctors, lawyers, professors, and others to tell them what to do are long past. Today, the masses of the people in Africa are in motion. And so we need a Congress of that type. And that may also be something for us to reflect on as we think about the events in Burkina Faso and also elsewhere. This important importance of uh, basing ourselves around the majority of people and speaking uh, with their interests at the center of our thinking. Um, of course, they, uh, one of the reasons the Congress was held at the time it was, was that 
Many of the delegates to Manchester also took part in this event. This is the founding of the World Federation of Trade Unions in 1945, the first time when all the labor organizations of the world joined together in one organization, both those from Europe, North America, the Soviet Union, China, and the colonial countries, including uh, Africa. And so it was a very important opportunity. And this spirit of internationalism, of being concerned with the struggles of people, not only in the Pan-African world, but also in Asia, and also of working people internationally, was one of the key features of the Manchester Congress. And one of the reasons why even today people speak about the Manchester Congress as being one of the key events in the uh, Pan-African movement. Uh, so what else? Well, the, one of the other features... Can we go to the next slide and see what the next slide is? Yes. One of the other features of the Congress, as I said, was it, it was a summation of the struggles that had been waged throughout Africa and the diaspora. So who had been the key force in these struggles? Of course, just before the Congress took place, there was a general strike in Nigeria, the first in that country's history. And there had been mass struggles that had broken out throughout the Caribbean as well as other parts of Africa during the 1930s. So the organizers of the Congress had the view that the force which is actually going to change things, the force which is going to end colonial rule, the force which is going to end racism, the force which is going to change the world for the better is the masses of the people, working people of all countries, but particularly in Africa and the diaspora. So this was one of the uh, points which they concluded from recent history. Okay, we go to the next slide, please. So the, one of the other things which they decided and made this Congress very different from others is that they determined that, if necessary, force would be used to change the world in favor of Africa and Africans. And this declaration, which is one of the famous declarations of the Congress, illustrates that point. They said that there is an end to, to begging, to sending delegations Today, we must take things in our own hands. Okay, next uh, slide, please. They also very clearly rejected certain types of political and economic institutions. Um, I'm sure what's actually reflected in this slide. Can we go on to the next slide as well, please? But you can see the uh, essence of their thinking. They said that they condemned what they called the monopoly of capital, that the economic systems which should be established in Africa shouldn't be of this type. In other words, the type imposed by the big imperialist powers. Next slide. And of course, they also made it clear that the political institutions which had been imposed by the colonial powers were alien. Uh, we could call them Eurocentric. And these should be condemned as well. And at the same time, they condemned the artificial borders which they said had been imposed on Africa by the colonial powers. Okay, we can try the next slide. Okay, that's, that's fine. The other uh, key areas in the Congress, and I'm making a summation now, uh, were the question of the position of women and the rights of women, which was also a departure from other Congresses. And as I said before, the question of internationalism. And at the same time as organizing this Congress, they also organized two uh, colonial people's Congresses, where the key delegates organized alongside people from India, uh, from Sri Lanka, from Burma, and from other countries in Asia. They had the conception that oppressed people of all countries had to unite in order to fight for their freedom. So these are some of the uh, key elements uh, of the Manchester Congress. 
And you could say that we then need to consider, well, what's happened in the last 70 years? How have these important uh, resolutions, this important political orientation, how has it been developed since? So I have very little time, so I'm going to make a very quick summary uh, of my view. You could say that um, although the Congress gave this import important orientation, um, it was only partially implemented. Uh, in many countries, or certainly in several countries, the idea that the majority of people had to be organized in order to bring an end to a colonial rule. This was a question that was taken up for solution, uh, but it wasn't taken to its conclusion. So that if we look at Africa today, we can say that the anti-colonial struggle hasn't been brought to its end that the very things which the delegates in Manchester spoke about, the monopoly of capital, the economic systems imposed by the big powers are still in key positions. The alien political institutions, the systems of Paris, of Westminster, of uh, Washington DC and so on, these are the political systems which uh, hold sway over the African continent. So Eurocentric political institutions are, and Eurocentric economic institutions and models are a major problem confronting the continent. And the, what we could call Africa-centered economic systems, Africa-centered political systems, which put the majority of people at the center of things, and which build societies around the needs and requirements of the majority of people, these are, generally speaking, weakly developed uh, in Africa with all the consequences that we can see. Um, and, of course, the big powers today do their best to uh, re-emphasize and reimpose their Eurocentric political systems and values, and they call these universal values, as if everyone should adopt them. Uh, but those of us living in Europe know that these values and these systems don't work in Europe. So why would they work in Africa or anywhere else? So if we look at the uh, situation today, very briefly again, and we heard from Aziz yesterday about some of these uh, issues, um, but we can say that, uh, generally speaking, the struggle to, which we can see as a pan-African struggle, to put the majority of people at the center of society is still the key question which confronts the African continent. And as I say, how to develop these alternative institutions, Africa-centered institutions. So today, uh, Africa is, uh, you could say, in the grip of uh, what some of us call a new scramble. Uh, some of you will be aware of the old scramble, which is usually symbolized by the infamous Berlin Conference in 1884-1885. But the new scramble is uh, no less intense. In fact, it could be said to be more intense even than the old scramble. The old scramble, as you probably know, ended in the First World War. The new scramble, we're not sure yet where it will end or what role we have to play in ending it. Uh, but we can see if we look at... Uh, in the last uh, 20 years or so, the uh, characteristics of that scramble, perhaps first most noticeable in the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, where a war is uh, almost, we could say, ongoing, but certainly in the mid-1990s, a major war developed. And uh, I'm not sure about in Germany, but certainly in Britain, the war which took place in DR Congo was presented as an inter-African war. Uh, in fact, it was a war between the big monopolies, multinational companies. And if you look at the UN reports and so on, they name all these companies that were involved. A war which led to the, the deaths of some 10 million people, uh, which is roughly equivalent to the number of deaths during the first scramble presided over by the Belgian king, Leopold. 
So we have this new scramble, and the major characteristic of it is that there are new players involved, uh, particularly the nations of the BRICS, and particularly China. And you will be aware that China is now the major economic power in Africa, the major trading power. And the old powers, particularly the US, but also the European powers, are uh, contesting these new rivals. They contest them in particular by military means. And as Aziz pointed out last night, AFRICOM is one of the main means for this uh, contestation. Uh, AFRICOM, again, we don't have time to talk about all of its activities, but of course one of its main activities was the organization of the invasion of Libya. It's also involved in the uh, invasion of, uh, of Mali, and anyway, a whole range of other activities out, the, out, of, out throughout the continent. So the, the militarization of Africa uh, has major consequences as well as the continual uh, economic plunder of the continent. And again, one can look at all the kinds of facts and figures which, ha which can demonstrate exactly what's uh, going on in the continent and the problems which uh, have arisen. At the same time, it's also clear that there have been uh, major developments in Africa, particularly economic developments. Again, as you probably know, uh, African countries or some African countries are some of the fastest growing economies in the world. They're sought after not only for their resources but also as markets for the products of various countries, not least China but also others. Um, and economists reckon that if the economies of Africa were united in one federated state, they'd be roughly equal to the economy of India at the moment or one of the other rising powers. So there are many arguments which people advance for uh, the economic unity of Africa um, as well as the political considerations which we've been discussing uh, over the weekend. The situation which faces the African continent, both the military intervention in Libya and other countries has had uh, anyway, major consequences both in Africa but also internationally. Uh, during the last session uh, there was some talk about Boko Haram and so on and it's interesting that uh, the invasion of uh, Libya uh, has played a major role in creating the conditions one can say for uh, the uh, spread of what the big powers call terrorism. And it's interesting that in Mali, where France, Britain, the US, and so on, claim that there was such a threat to, of terrorism, was exactly the place where the United States had their anti-terrorism, anti-terror network established for 10 years previous to the intervention. So the, anyway, the invasion of Libya uh, led to the support of uh, all kinds of uh, sinister organizations that also have their links in Mali and also have their links with northern Nigeria and Boko Haram. So you can say that behind the activities of these organizations one can find the finances, the special services of the US, Britain, France, and the other big powers. So the military intervention itself, and particularly that in Libya, has also created the conditions for the mass exodus of uh, refugees, asylum seekers of various kinds, who find the situation in various African countries so intolerable that they're willing to, or forced to risk their lives to flee to Europe. And uh, we have seen uh, unprecedented examples of that uh, exodus 
over the last year. In fact, only last week there were reports of new uh, deaths of those crossing the Mediterranean uh, from Libya. And so the, uh, what we find is the big powers weak being what we call in English crocodile tears uh, for those uh, who have, are fleeing, where they themselves have created the conditions which lead to the exodus. Uh, they create the conditions both by their military intervention, particularly that in Libya, but also by the economic system of a neoliberal globalization, which they maintain by all means, even by military means, across the African continent. And if we look at the uh, economic impact um, as well as the military impact, I think there's something like 11 million, these are maybe conservative figures, 11 million displaced people throughout the African continent. That's a third of all the displaced people. I use that official term, displaced a third of all displaced people in the world, so that many African economies are not only dealing with the problems of their own population, but also migrants from uh, neighboring countries. Uh, and there is a general pressure which is leading to this mass exodus, which all the uh, indicators are will continue for uh, many years to come. So... Uh, Although I'm, I, was said I, I was told I wasn't supposed to speak about migrants, I'm just going to uh, conclude by saying one other, making one other point, and that is about the role of the uh, diaspora, because in the history of Pan-Africanism, if we take the 20th century uh, as a whole, uh, the diaspora has played a very key role in the whole development of Pan-Africanism, as I indicated at the beginning of my presentation. And so then there's the question of what role the diaspora plays today. I've tried to indicate that the situation confronting the African continent, um, generally speaking, that situation is created externally, not internally. Uh, I know people like to argue about all of this. In fact, I was uh, somewhere the other day where we were talking about what are called illicit uh, currency flows out of Africa. And I can't remember exactly the statistics, but the illicit currency flows out of the African continent uh, in the last uh, 30 years are in the trillions. Uh, it's more than equivalent to Africa's total debt it's more than entire Africa, GDP, and so on. This is illicit uh, currency flows, financial flows from the continent. And uh, people like to think, or sometimes it's presented, that these flows are mainly to do with corruption, because there are some African politicians who are corrupt, and so on and so forth. In fact, uh, according to the latest figures, I think only something like 5% of these massive currency flows out of the continent are because of corruption. Then people mention sometimes criminal activities, drug smuggling and various things. And apparently drug smuggling only accounts for about 30% of these illicit, this illicit flow of wealth. And the, the major source of this flow of wealth out of the African continent is the activity of the big multinational companies. Uh, because they have developed a system to avoid tax payments, to involve third countries, and so on and so forth, uh, so that they buy very cheap, they sell very dear, anyway, so on, without going into the, all the economics. So in other words, the drain on Africa's wealth, the economic impoverishment of the, con of the continent, is due to external factor. It's due to the big banks, multinationals of Britain, of Germany, of France, of Italy, of the US, of the Asian countries and so on. And so if we look at the economic uh, impact on Africa as well as the military impact 
the invasion of the continent as a consequence of the new scramble. We find that these crimes are being carried out in countries in which we are living, like Germany, Britain, and so on. So then the question is, what is it we're doing about it? And I remember at the time of the invasion of Libya, talking to various people, and they had all kinds of reasons why they shouldn't be concerned about Libya. Some people said they didn't support Gaddafi, and some people said other things, and there were various excuses given. Uh, but the fact is that the, those who call themselves Pan-Africanists, the continent was being invaded, and uh, you could say not enough was done to prevent that. And the question is, how is that to be prevented? How can we stop this external intervention in Africa's affairs so that the people of Africa can determine their own affairs, determine their own futures, which is the Pan-African vision that we all have? And as I say, I think that those of us who are in the diaspora, uh, in the heartlands of the big powers, we have a particular responsibility because we have to organize ourselves in such a way that Britain or Germany or France cannot invade the continent. And so how must we organize ourselves? Well, uh, we, of course, can only organize ourselves uh, in concert, in unity with the people of France, Germany, US, other countries, who are also concerned about those crimes or are also concerned about the activities of their governments and so on. Uh, and so then we have to ask ourselves where we are in relation to those movements. I know in, my, in Britain, where I live, we have a very uh, flourishing, you could say, anti-war movement. And we, when you talk to Africans, uh, you ask, uh, are you involved in the anti-war movement? They say, no, it's, there's this problem, there's that problem, and so on. So if we're not involved in the movement against war, how are we going to prevent war? So then when... <laughs> then when the attack on the continent comes, then what, what position are we in to... Do we shrug our shoulders, or what do we do? Or if it is the big multinational companies uh, of Britain or Germany who are carrying out these crimes in Africa, then what action are we taking alongside other people in these countries who are concerned about the activities of these big multinational companies and so on and so forth? And one could give uh, other examples. Some people I know talk about, especially in Britain at the moment, there's a lot of talk about reparations. And I always think to myself, what kind of government will it be in Britain that makes reparation for the crimes it's committed? But we could ask the same thing about Germany. What kind of German government will make reparation? Or France, or any of these big countries. So then we also have to think about uh, what kind of government we want to have in those countries in which we uh, reside and how we act alongside other people who also want uh, alternatives to that which is. Because at the end of the day, the question of alternatives, of visioning a different world, the idea that a different world is possible, not only possible but necessary, is something that I think we need to reflect on. If we think that a different, another world is possible, then the question comes, what are we doing to build it? Because, as we know, we can't wait for the new world to come in order to build it. We build a new world from within the old world. So we develop the alternatives now. They're not going to come by waiting and so on. And then we have to think about new ways of doing things, because when we adopt old ways of doing things, which are, are generally Eurocentric ways of doing things, we find often that these are 
ways which prohibit us from moving forward. They are forms, they are institutions, they are ways which preserve the old and don't build the new. And I remember thinking yesterday that very often at these events, uh, we talk about leaders in what I would call a Eurocentric way. Uh, we think that only a few people can be leaders. So this is an old, you can say 20th century Eurocentric definition. Thank you, that allows me to drink my water. Um, so the new thinking is that everybody has to be a leader. We all have to lead. If we recognize the necessity of doing something, then we have to do it. We have to organize it. We can't wait for somebody else to come. And then, you know, how we, how we even organize our meetings and so on. Because also we, we tend to have Eurocentric models of meeting. Um, so we have, you know, some put one person standing up here, or we have three people standing here, and then we ask them questions and so on. So why do we think that the people who are here have any more answers than the people down there? Because if the people up here had the answers, then we would, wouldn't have any problems, we would have solved them. So we, anyway, this is just my, this is not to criticize anybody, it's just... Uh, <clears throat> A way of thinking about things, um, which anyway to me are important. <coughs> also, we could say the kind of organizations that we built, are they new organizations? Are they organizations of the new, of the new world? Or are they organizations of the old? So one of the key questions then becomes the one of uh, empowerment. Are we empowered in the organizations that we're building? Or do we have the old organizations where we have a couple of leaders and everybody else is passive and so on? So in this, this new world that I said that people talked about in 1945, they had the conception that the majority of people were the force which was going to build the new. But the problem with the struggles over the last 70 years is that although there may be a conception that this, the majority of people are the force which is going to change things, when some change is made, the empowerment of that force stops and the old political institutions of Europe are imposed, which are institutions to prevent people's empowerment. You know, in Europe, in history, they had this... Uh, this multi-party system and so on. And when it was first invented in Britain, you know, in Britain we claim we invented everything that wasn't invented in Egypt. <laughs> this, uh, I'm coming. Uh, when this was invented, um, there, nobody voted. They had parties, but they had no one voted. So now we have the system where we have parties, but they allow us to put a cross on a piece of paper every few years or something like this. But this is not about empowering people. So if to build this new world in which people are set at the center, then we have to have organizations in which people are at the center, in which we all take part in decision making, and then we all implement the decisions and so on and so forth. I mean, these are, anyway just my views. So I, there's some indication I should stop. So I will stop there. And thank you for your consideration and time. <clears throat>